became interested in the question of aesthetics in education because I noticed in reading philosophy of education as well as contemporary debates on education that one of the biggest issues of debate and perhaps disagreement comes down to how do you know something? What does it mean to know something? And from that, how do we learn? A lot of theories in education about how we learn focus on cognitive skills, analytical skills. And I think that the structure of our school system reflects this. Knowing something is how well you know something is measured by a test of aptitude, cognitive skills, tests, grades, SATs, all of these things reflect a cognitive ability. Now, I don't think that that's wrong, but in my reading about the history of education and the meaning of a liberal arts education, it became apparent to me that our mind works in many different ways. And that there's different ways we come to know different aspects of reality. So I began to ask myself, why have cognitive skills risen to the top of what we think it means to know something or to be intelligent? And what are some other ways of thinking about intelligence or knowledge? And from that, what would that mean for our educational context, settings, practices, curriculum, the role of the teacher, etc. When I began to read classical views of education, it became very apparent to me that the contemplative side of human nature was understood to be as important, if not the true end of education, to be to nurture that contemplative side, the side that can perceive behind the material reality, hidden causes and hidden movers of those causes. So what I began to see was that our educational systems are grounded on an understanding of the human person that overemphasizes this cognitive dimension of the human person and the human mind and has relegated our contemplative nature to, if it's there at all, as something that's purely subjective, but not relevant to knowledge. So contemplation, joy, love, experiences of beauty, if they happen, aren't telling us anything. This view of the contemplative side of the human person, I think, contrasts with the readings that I gave you today from Roger Scruton and Jack Maritan. These are simply two of the authors that I have read in the past couple of years trying to ad address the aesthetic dimension of the human person or the, the contemplative side of our nature. And I picked these two for different reasons. One, the Scruton reading that I gave you is a concise, I'd say, attempt to review a really important debates about what is beauty, this fundamental question, what is beauty? Maritan, this book, Creative Intuition and Art and Poetry, he wrote as a series of lectures, the National Gallery of Art in the 1950s. He wrote this, and goes beyond what I've assigned for today, but he wrote this as a critique of surrealism and of artistic movements that had separated the expression of beauty from the search for truth. So Maritan is trying to recover a classical Greek tradition and a Christian tradition of beauty and bring it into debates today, well, today in the 1950s, about postmodern influences in art and culture and surrealism. However, I think what he says about creative intuition and art and poetry has tremendous ramifications for the underlying psychology of the human person in education. 
Specifically, one concept that I want us to spend some time thinking about is his distinction between the spiritual pre-conscious of the person and the Freudian subconscious. We shall get there. But I think both of these readings are very relevant to how we respond to the critique or the argument in Neil Postman's Amusing Ourselves to Death in 1980, written in the early 1980s, that our minds are being dumbed down by forms of entertainment that we call the news, or frankly, that we call education. Again, to bring this back to the present moment, this argument very well articulated by Postman, repeated by others more recently with regards to digital technology. The argument is essentially that culture and technology are dumbing down our minds. So my contention here is that these philosophical readings that I'm talking about have implications for how we think about the human person and how we think about knowing that are eminently practical for extremely important decisions about how to structure the classroom, what we teach, and how we teach. These readings have both philosophical relevance as well as very practical relevance. And as I've begun to really interrogate and think about liberal arts education, it has been interesting to me to note that this term, liberal arts education, often gets used to mean several different things that I think are related, but also somewhat distinct. The term liberal arts education is often used as synonymous with an education in the great books. Think of James Murphy's article, Why a Core? The idea that there are certain ideas and authors that have stood the test of time and have been influential. The curriculum of St. John's College or the curriculum, the core uh, curriculum at Columbia would essentially be a great book's understanding of liberal arts education. A second understanding of liberal arts education goes back more to the classical concept of the quadrivium and the trivium, grammar, rhetoric, logic, math, biology. The idea that reality is complex and our minds apprehend reality in different ways. Simply put, being able to express yourself in rhetoric is a different kind of way of knowing something than understanding the mathematical calculations that go into building a bridge. But both of those are ways of knowing the world, but require a different education. To build a bridge and to make a good argument requires a different approach to education because our minds are shaped in different by encountering different things. A third way that I think liberal arts education gets used is synonymous with a human formation, a certain kind of character, a certain kind of Christian virtue. Oftentimes liberal arts education essentially gets used to mean moral education or Christian education. When I visit some of the independent K to 12 schools that have a liberal arts mission, one of the things I have noticed that's common across nearly all of them is a distinct emphasis on the importance of beauty. Beauty in the classroom, in terms of paintings, icon. One K to 12 school I visited in um, Boston, the walls are pink and green and blue. It's bright, it's colorful. There's an integration between classroom learning and outdoor experiences in nature. And all of them, not all, but many of these schools have begun to reincorporate the fine arts, crafts, painting, um, weaving, manual expressions of fine arts, right? making beautiful things. In fact, one of the things I like about children is that anything they make is beautiful, even things that kind of look ugly to the eye, but they made it. 
and it's exciting. So these four understandings of what liberal arts education is, great books, quadrivium and trivium, Christian formation or moral formation and beauty. That's just a conceptual framework. I think any particular school probably does a little bit of each of those or some of them do more than others. Obviously a school of the arts, dance, ballet is gonna do a lot more of the beauty and the fine arts and they're probably not gonna do as much of the great text. I think all of those models that I'm talking about are all oriented in one way or another to try to push back on the overly cognitive achievement test score way of teaching, learning, and assessing. So they're all just, for my purposes, they're all different than just classroom learning, testing, experimentation, et cetera. So what I've increasingly come to think is that there needs to be A, a country as big and as diverse as the United States is going to have very different kinds of educational institutions that have different emphases. And that's perfectly normal and that's fine. However, I do think if we stop and think that one of the universal characteristics of the human person is that we are made to perceive beauty and to desire beauty, as I think we read about today, especially in Scruton, then we have to think about what can all types of educational systems do to foster that awe, that wonder? I think we're in grave danger that if we don't educate this desire for beauty, it will be miseducated. And I think this is Postman's contention in amusing ourselves to death. If we don't educate the human desire for beauty, it can become dumbed down through forms of entertainment that over time weaken those very cognitive skills that we prize so much. So I think that the rediscovery of the aesthetic dimension of education is relevant not just to the fine arts. I think it's relevant to all subjects, including those that we tend to think are the most cognitive, such as science, engineering, and math. Precisely because aesthetics, the desire for beauty, the ability for wonder and awe leads to the creative intuition behind scientific discovery. If you look at the history of science or look at the biography of scientists who have invented things, very often the great inventions they have had did not come from a meticulous application of the scientific method. It came from an intuition that then gets worked out with the aid of the scientific method. But those intuitions, those insights came from their creativity. So, although we're not gonna answer all of the questions that arise from bringing these questions to light, I think that these readings from Scruton, Maritan, many others, point to really important contemporary debates about a system of education that focuses on problem solving or credentials or the acquisition of skills to such a degree that we've almost obscured the importance of educating human creativity for innovation. Some more specific questions that I think these readings are suggesting that we should talk about, right? Roger Scruton starts in his book of, on beauty, a very short introduction. He lays out what he calls platitudes, common sayings, off the cuff things people would say about beauty. And one of them is simply that beauty is subjective. It's not objective, you know, art 
beauty is in the eye of the, of the beholder. What makes an artwork beautiful is that I made it. He's going to counter that argument. And he's going to ask, where does that come from? Well, first of all, whether you agree that beauty is subjective or objective, it's important to acknowledge that this is a huge philosophical debate. And you can find people on both sides of this debate. Scruton, I think, very clearly comes down on the side, as does Maritain, that there is something objective about beauty. But it's important to consider why some people say it's purely subjective and what does it mean to say there's something objective about beauty. I would also counter or put out there as an argument that whether you ultimately think beauty is subjective or objective, I think it's important to ask. What is the purpose of beauty in human life? Is there a connection between beauty and living a good life? And if so, why? One other, I'd say platitude about beauty or one other common way of thinking about beauty that usually comes from the more side that beauty is subjective, is that beauty doesn't have anything to do with our political order or our sense of common good or friendships. You know, beauty is almost like so mystical that it's not relevant to our relations with other people, whether those be personal or, you know, in the political realm. I want to contend that beauty is actually extremely important to, as I've said already, education, but also to politics and to friendship and family. So there is also a line of argument that beauty is actually important to liberty, to the maintenance of a free society. This you can see in authors we were not reading in this class, but Edmund Burke, Michael Oakeshott, Alexis de Tocqueville, beauty and liberty are related. So what I really want is to think through what are these important debates about beauty? And then again, bring it down to the specifics of what does this mean for our educational practices to foster creativity, intuition, a spirit of discovery in all fields of knowledge? How do we educate people as well to be able to forego some immediate kinds of sensory pleasure to engage in the types of practices of beauty that lead us to higher good? What does it take to educate somebody to be able to go into a museum, perhaps without any knowledge of art history, but be arrested, let their attention be arrested for an hour in front of one painting? Um, I'm incredibly interested in what does it mean to bring the fine arts that is education and artistic endeavors, bring that back into great books, educations and scientific education. What's the role of fine arts curriculum, classes in the fine arts, painting, art, poetry? How is that related to what's going on in the engineering lab? How's that related to knowing the ancient world? And Honestly, on a very practical level, in order to bring beauty and the fine arts back into public education, science education, how do you demonstrate its impact on students? All that I've just said about the importance of beauty to the human person and its objective nature and its relationship to truth and the way that beauty can foster innovation and creativity and further scientific innovation, that sounds great. How am I going to persuade an administrator that this is correct? What evidence can be given? Can this be tested? Can it be, do we do it through self-evaluations of students? How do we 
come up with evidence that's not only the abstract reasoning and logic about the human person, how do we show that? How do we show that in a way that's persuasive and that's going to shift educational practice to actually include these things? One way, and I won't go into a lot of details, but one way to show this is, for example, through the, the trip to Italy that I engaged in on engineering and beauty, where there was a combination of field work, so to speak, looking at historical sites of bridges, monuments, churches, studying the technological innovations in the context of studying who the innovators were and what political trends they were trying to respond to, what ideas they had about the sacred that they were trying to enshrine. So just as an example, when on this trip in Italy, we, we went to the rotunda, the rotunda, the Palladian rotunda, which has little replicas all over the world, one of which is Jefferson's Monticello. But in this building called the rotunda, Andrea Palladio was trying to develop an architecture that reflected the ideals of a Republican form of government. Then a few days later, we're in Florence and we're in the Duomo, a Catholic cathedral that is a marvelous work of science because the tower See, I don't even know the technical terms. I was in there. But I climbed that tower with a structural engineer who was nothing other than geeking out in this rainy outdoor staircase we were on. Well, no, the staircase was indoors. We're standing at the top of the Duomo, marveling at how on earth, I think it was in the 13th century, he had this vision to build this structure that engineers told him was impossible and it was going to fall down. But he had envisioned through his complex mathematical calculations a way to build this really, really high dome. And the layout of the church is trying to elevate our minds and our hearts to God. That's the purpose of this hype. So things like that, right? Trying to think um, what makes something innovative was somebody who had a crazy idea that they were able to spell out mathematically and engineering and at the same time, create a work of engineering marvel that's also deeply symbolic about the ideas that those buildings represent. So one of the outcomes of that class, I would contend, is that students who have that kind of engineering education will do very different kinds of senior projects, will go on to build very different kinds of buildings. However, that would require a different form of assessment of education that goes over a longer period of time or attempts to ultimately assess this thing we call creativity, which is by definition hard to assess through our standard metrics, I would argue. But I think it can be demonstrated. Okay, so now to get what, and the way it can be demonstrated I think would be through case studies. Our way of demonstrating something works as often has to become down to a number. But for example, in business schools, if you want to study what makes a business successful, you don't really run regressions. You study the business. You do a case study. Okay. In the preface to his short introduction on beauty, Roger Scruton right away tries to break through some platitudes on beauty. One of them, which we heard echoed in, uh, in particular in the Dana Joya video on beauty, is that beauty is not attractiveness. There may be some element of it that it is, but as Scruton says in his preface, beauty can be both consoling and disturbing. Beauty can be both sacred and profane. It can be exhilarating or it can be chilling. He also states in his preface that beauty is a universal value that emanates from our rational nature. Let me repeat that. Beauty is universal 
and it's fundamentally related to our reason. And I think echoing Maritan, who wants to put beauty and poetry into the realm of the practical intellect, not the speculative intellect, the practical intellect, Scruton says, our sense of beauty has an indispensable part to play in shaping the human world. That is, our sense of beauty isn't only about creating artistic objects that are beautiful, which I happen to like. Our sense of beauty is about how we shape the human world in its totality, how we think about our political structure, how we think about family, how we think about like love, education. Now, some of the debates that he gets into, Scruton does, is that, you know, the reason his opening statements are rather bold, Roger Scruton was nothing if not bold. Just by way of brief introduction, I'm by no means a Roger Scruton expert. In fact, I had not read anything by Roger Scruton until about six months before he died. He died earlier this year in 2020. And I read my first book by him in November of 2019. And let me tell you, I could not put it down. I read it cover to cover twice. I read a lot. I don't often read books cover to cover because for a variety of reasons. The first book I read by him, which I highly recommend, is called Fools, Frauds, and Firebrands. I'll tell you about it later, but it's essentially a critique of postmodern theory in the, in the humanities. And it was very relevant to me because I was trained in social science, which has sort of two philosophies, one emerging out of rationalism and scientism and the other emerging out of postmodernism. So he helped enlighten for me some of the philosophical debates in the social sciences. I'm less familiar with those debates in the humanities, in history or English literature, because I'm not, those aren't the fields that I've studied, but I have read uh, in particular the French social theorists that he talks about, Foucault, Lacan. Um, and they all, I think, have what I think the commonality is between the debates in the humanities and the debates in the human sciences. It comes back again to this question of what is the human person. So it was helpful for me to see those, those debates. And then he takes on how they've played out in the kinds of academic work we get in history, English. Um, and he's in a little bit in uh, political theory. Okay, so this is the second book that I've read by Scruton and now I've read a few other things. So um, some of the debates he wants to get in is, is, um, is this aesthetic way of life? Some have argued that this aesthetic way of life, this emphasis on beauty is somehow dangerous that beauty can mislead us, beauty can take us away from the good, beauty can seduce us. I would almost, I've never said this before, but I'll just say it. I would almost say that the subplot of any opera I've ever seen is that beauty is seductive and destructive. Falling in love is gonna lead to, you know, love triangles and fights and you know desperate things that we can't control you know this is kind of the subtext not of all but of a lot of operas right beauty is dangerous because it le leads us to lose our minds and hey that's just who we are as human beings we're so enamored of some person or thing that even if he's my king or he's my king's brothers king, i don't know you know just i just gotta have it and then I end either committing suicide or, you know, the first opera I ever saw at the Met, Othello, where he's ragingly jealous because someone has plotted to overthrow him by getting him ragingly jealous to believe that his wife is unfaithful to him. And he believes it so much that he murders her. And after he murders her, he finds out that it wasn't true and he commits suicide. So beauty, love, has destroyed the king and destroyed these people's lives. That's the tragic aspect of beauty. It can take us away from virtue. On, an, on another way of thinking about beauty that Scruton talks about comes from Aquinas, where beauty is a transcendental, it's a big word, but what that means is that it's a feature of reality that's present in all things. And it's a way, beauty is a way for us to become aware of the supreme gift of being. 
This is a very different way of understanding beauty. That beauty opens us up. Experiences of beauty, acts of creating beautiful things, open us up to the transcendental, to receive all of creation as a gift from a creator. Beauty manifests to us, creatures, the greatness of the supreme being. Beauty reveals to creatures the greatness of the being that created us. So this second view, right, of beauty as a transcendental leads to what Scruton calls a disinterested way of understanding beauty, let's say. That beauty creates a sense of pleasure that is not utilitarian, it's contemplative. That beauty is a way that we experience a connection to the totality of all of reality. It's a kind of pleasure that's not fleeting or utilitarian, but enduring. It produces a resonance in the soul, not a fragmentation. And I think a lot of these debates about certain forms of entertainment or certain types of media dumbing us down are ultimately trying to get at which kinds of pleasure lead to an opening and a resonance in our soul and which kinds of pleasure do we feel in the moment but later on deplete us, fragment us. Before I move on to Maritan, I'll just say that ultimately, I think the kinds of question that Scruton is opening up and that I wanna open up are, what does it mean to educate people to understand these philosophical debates of beauty, to engage with beauty in the world and to form judgments about beauty similar to the way we form judgments about truth. Now let me turn to Maritan. In this book by Maritan, Creative Intuition and Art and Poetry, these were lectures he developed to deliver to the National Galleries of Art in the 1950s. Um, the subtext is a critique of postmodernism and certain trends in art, in fine arts, painting mostly. Um, and I began to read this book at the urging of Dana Joya. He is a businessman who really wanted to be a writer and eventually became not just a full-time writer, but the chairman of the National Endowment of the Arts. And he's fundamentally convinced that writing poetry, reciting poems needs to be part of public education, not just in public schools, but in public libraries. In public government funded institutions of all kinds that work on culture. He's traveled the 50 states running poetry workshops. A lot of times with people who are not formally educated beyond high school. He then taught at UCLA and has recently retired from teaching. He pointed me in the direction of this book. Um, for a couple of reasons that I now see having read this book a few times and having had the pleasure of discussing with him. Yes, I find incredible pleasure in discussing these ideas with a very smart person like Dana Joya. What I think is significant about the Jacques Maritain book, and it's also very challenging, that as I've said already, our educational systems 
tend to focus on the acquisition of cognitive skills, analytical skills, problem solving skills, think of Dewey, right? Problem solving skills, scientific, such that everything becomes a problem to be solved. However, this has led to a reductionistic understanding of the human person because most of the time our brains are not in problem solving mode. So what Maritan helps to do here is to restore other kinds of knowledge alongside scientific knowledge that comes from using our cognitive parts of our brain. So Maritan talks about scientific knowledge, moral knowledge, but he also talks about poetic knowledge, which is what I wanna focus on. But just to be clear, Maritan's use of the word poetic knowledge is trying to distinguish it from knowledge about God. How so? Knowledge about God is ultimately, or that's spiritual knowledge. Knowledge about God, knowledge about who God ultimately is, it's not what Maritan is focusing on here. He wants to focus on action in the world that emanates from the spiritual preconscience, but has a, but shapes the way that we enter, that we do things in the world. And he's trying to distinguish this from spiritual knowledge or mystical knowledge, which is insights into the nature of who God is. And mystical experiences are real, I think, and a lot of people have them, but they're also really rare. What Maritan is focusing more on is poetic knowledge. And for him, poetic knowledge is not writing poetry. It's, it's a practical virtue of how we work in the world. So let me say a little bit more about this. Um, so poetic knowledge for Maritan is communication between the soul and the world. And he says, poetic knowledge is the soul as known in the experience of the world and the world known in the experience of the soul. In poetic intuition, objective reality and subjectivity, the world and the whole soul coexist inseparably. At that moment, sense and sensation are brought back to the heart, blood to the spirit, passion to the intuition. And through the vital and non-conceptual actuation of the intellect, all the powers of the soul are also actuated in their roots. Those are a lot of big words. And I wanna to try to unpack it a little bit and explain some of the significance of it for us, for this question around education. To understand what Maritan is saying about this poetic knowledge, this communication between the soul and the world, we have to also understand what he means by the spiritual pre-conscious and how it's different from the Freudian subconscious. This is in chapter three. He's trying to recover the idea coming from the Greeks, but also present in the Christian tradition, that human persons have a spiritual or a musical pre-conscious. Plato would have used this word, kind of the musical, this word, the musical pre-conscious, and distinguish it from what we typically think of the, in the, when we use the term subconscious. And Maritan says that the Freudian subconscious is about blood and flesh, instincts, tendencies, complexes, repressed images, desires, traumatic memories. The Freudian subconscious is, it's automatic, it's death. We don't, we can't really master it. Again, think of those Italian operas that I just talked about. What's at play is this subconscious that it's just driving us. It's pushing us to do things, it's not rational, but it's powerful and it can lead to our good or our destruction, but we can't direct it. Or at least 
only partially. Maritan says that no, we have something more. We have something he calls the spiritual preconscious or preconscious that he says pertains to the spiritual powers of the human soul and what he calls the inner abyss of personal freedom and of the personal thirst and striving for knowing and seeing, grasping and expressing. So what Maritan is trying to do is to say that this wild nature of our subconscious, this, automate, this automatism can't fully explain this place inside of us where we experience a true sense of freedom, where our reason and our emotions are integrated and not at war with each other. So in the Freudian subconscious, we have these instincts and these drives that we just act on even if our, we're fighting them. And Maritain's not denying that. He's absolutely acknowledging that that happens. But he's saying that there's a deeper power. There's a deeper place in us where the reasons and the emotions are integrated. And then that's the basis of personal freedom. And for Maritain, that spiritual preconscious has a connection to God, but it works itself out in the world. This is important. First of all, it's important to recover the spiritual preconscious, and then it's important to think about what it is and how it works itself out in the world. So this intellect, the spiritual pre preconscious leads our intellect to encounter objects and ideas in a dynamic process. I, the, the intellect then works itself out through action. That's why this is a practical thing. It's not only a speculative thing. The illuminating intellect, he calls it, encounters a pattern, an image, forms a concept and then engages with the world to understand it more fully and then reflects back on it. In chapter four, he goes more into depth on this question. And he's trying to push us to think about the aspect of the human person, the aspect of our soul that is deeper than sensory perception. That there's an aspect of the human person that's not simply responding to something in the environment. It's deeper than, than those things. There, he, he calls it a root activity. And he's afraid that we can't cut off that kind of soul that we have from these powerful desires and love and leave them prey to the automatic unconscious, the Freudian automatic subconscious. And he wants to think about what does it mean to raise the intellect and the soul into a genuinely human state where those powers of the soul participate in, in intelligence and are permeated with intelligence. So what's at stake here is that this powerful spiritual preconscious can become integrated with our reason. And therefore, he even goes as far as to say, a way that we participate in divine life or it becomes superficial and lacks integration and leads to fragmentation and personal dispersion. So poetry or poetic knowledge, this dynamic process that begins in the soul and works its way out in the world through objects, whether those be objects of fine art or scientific objects or other ways of engaging in the world and then works its way back in, how we do that is integral to a well-formed human life.
In other words, the objects we make and the actions we take both emanate from our spiritual preconscience, but they act back on it. And they form our identity and our subjectivity. It's what he wants. He wants those actions to form our identity and our subjectivity into beings who have inner qualities of stability and how to use our many capacities for the human good. This, these deep philosophical ideas, I think are reflected in his book, Education at the Crossroads, where we discussed his understanding of the human person as being created through love and having a kind of super existence. Those small words are extremely significant because he's pointing to what he goes into deeper and create here in creative intuition and art and poetry. That ultimately what's at stake in education, the end of education, is about forming that whole human person. And by that, he wants to put back in there educating the spiritual preconscience, which he does not think American pragmat pragmatist education is doing. That's his argument in education at a crossroads. In creative intuition, art, and poetry, he's talking about the fine arts. In education at the crossroads, he's using the same idea to critique pragmatic trends in American education. Because ultimately, the only education that's a good education is educating this inner capacity of the human person to work its reason out through action in the world and reflect on it. That's what education needs to be doing. If it does that well, then we can talk about, you know, scientific discovery and all these other things. If it doesn't do that part well, the way that we use our other capacities to create technology or to create art is going to dehumanize us. That's his fear, that if we don't have this poetic knowledge alongside conceptual knowledge or scientific knowledge, we're going to deform the human person and deform society and deform politics. So again, he's using this really key word liberation here in a very different way than I think some of the other authors. For him, liberation, and I'd say also for Scruton, liberation is not self-expression. Beauty, art, knowledge is not expressing myself. It's coming to know what reality is. And our freedom to express things needs to be brought into an order. We do have a capacity for self-expression. That doesn't tell us if we're using that capacity well. What tells us if we're using that capacity well is some concept of objective truth and objective reality, precisely because his starting point is that reality is created and it's given. In one way or another, some scientific philosophies don't think anything is given. Everything's a creation. That everything that we, the human person, is at the center of creation. We can change anything, we can do anything, there's no limitations. It's not Maritain's starting point. The starting point is that created order, created reality is given to us. And it's for us to use our intellect to discern the powers, the structures behind that created order. So as, so his vision of progress, he does have a vision of progress, but his vision of progress has a metric that's outside of human action. It's not that anything we do or anything we change is good. Progress, innovation isn't good in and of itself. It's good because it furthers some kind of human good, which we have to be able to judge with criteria that go beyond the material. So for Scruton and for Maritan, the very objects that we create are signs of another reality that's transcendent. But that transcendent reaches down into the material world and in that way becomes imminent. But they're signs. Everything we do, everything we create is a sign of another reality. So we can never not ask, we need to be asking the question, what is this thing we've created? What is this thing we know what is it a sign of? This is essentially Jasani's method of education and risk of education. Might be 
tempting at first read to think that Jasani's method of education is a method of religious education. How do we come to know God and how do we come to know the Christian faith? Because he was a Catholic priest. It's easy to think that's what he's doing here. But really, Jasani's method in risk of education is a method to try to get at what I think Maritan is talking about. That everything we learn and everything we do in education, we ultimately want to be asking the why question. Education isn't only about how. Not even science and engineering is about how. There's also the why question. And the Jasani method in risk of education is trying to put that why question back into every field of knowledge and not let the why question become synonymous with a question about God. It of course exists there, but it exists in all fields of education. And Jasani's method of education is arguing that whatever the subject matter is, we need to be activating these powers of the soul that are both eminently practical, but also asking about the significance and the sign of everything. It's very clear to me as a teacher and myself as a person <laughs> that if we don't think about these questions and do something to constantly nurture our creativity, that our ability for this creative intuition can definitely get dumbed down and it can flounder. So this process of, of activating and stimulating and forming a creative intuition truly is a dynamic process. Again, if you think back to Maritan's definition of education and education at a crossroads, education is a, is a dynamic process. It's a never ending it's almost like a beginning again, as we heard in the Benedictine tradition. This process has to constantly be done. It's not like you get a credential and then you are a creative person. No, you have to constantly be stimulating this. And I think a lot of the burnout we see in teachers and in students is because they've lost this creative intuition. And when they've lost that creative intuition, and when they're using the powers of reason or the powers of intellect purely or primarily for the end of manipulation of reality and not contemplation, you can do both. But if you're doing it purely for manipulation, I believe that that leads to fragmentation and over time wears out the very love of learning that we've been given. So I think understanding and trying to apply these ideas of the spiritual preconscious, poetic knowledge, creative intuition is crucial to recovering the love of learning, which as we heard in the Leclerc reading, the love of learning and the desire for the God, the desire for the infinite, the desire for mystery. Those two things are intimately related. How do we bring back desire? How do we shape desire? How do we educate it in all fields of knowledge for the good, for the personal good, and for the common good? I have certainly reached the point where I don't think that purely scientific rationalism, the idea that the only kind of truth that exists comes from the methods of empirical observation, the idea that the only kind of truth we can have comes from our perception of the world, this would be someone like David Hume. The only things we can know are things we can perceive with our senses. And I would, by extension, I would say this is also implicit in Dewey, if not explicit. The only kind of truth, the only kind of knowledge is sensory, material in some way. This is not what Maritan is saying. Postmodernism is saying that hey, look, our subjectivity is really important, but it's purely expressing the subject. Our subjectivity, our desire for, for beauty is nothing more than self-expression. This is also not what Scruton is saying and not what Maritan is saying. They're saying that our desires are part of what lead us to an objective truth, but they need to be educated to do that. The human person is a singular, unrepeatable, irreducible material object in the world. 
but the human person also has a subjectivity that flows outward to other human beings who are also singular objects, irreducible objects. So by educating our capacity for beauty, I believe education can transform us from the inside out and shape culture and family and politics. So educating this capacity for poetic knowledge is a really important part of how we think about how we interact with other people. Not purely about self-expression, but how we interact with other people and what kind of institutions we build. This tendency to want to make everything about human life something we can analyze and manipulate. A child who you love is not something you can analyze and manipulate. A student who's dying of cancer is not a situation you're gonna solve. It's not a problem to be solved. But the love of a child, the fear of death, are inescapable parts of human reality that we need to learn to live and in them to see a sign of the totality of being. We need to have a way and a place and a time to turn off the analyzing and the judging and to experience reality in all of its fullness. What does it take to be present to a young child who wants to sit there and play with you? And one day when I decided to forego what I was gonna do and just sit there and silently watch my little baby niece playing in the bathtub with her toys. Who knows what she's doing with all those toys? Who knows what kind of a world she's in playing with all those toys in the bathtub? And suddenly she looks up at me and she calls me Titi. And she says, Titi? And I said, yes, honey. She said, I love you. And in that moment, you just want to cherish that moment. And those moments of profound experiences of love are so fundamental to who we are. But if we live in a distracted world and our mind is always analyzing and manipulating or judging or doing, it's not that those things we're doing are wrong, but can we slow down to be present to that child? Fear of death. I think we live in an era that people are afraid of suffering and death. For me, there's no question that reading about beauty and experiences of beauty have absolutely helped me cope with fear and anxiety over death. Having lost a loved one not long ago, those emotions, right, which again, which I've said emanate from the spirit, from the subconscious, right, those fears those instincts to fear death, I think it's a real, I think it's a good thing we have an instinctual fear of death. We're not meant to desire death. I think there's something pathological with people who desire death. So that instinct is real and it's there for a reason. But there's times when you can't conquer that fear of death because the person you love is going to die. And what do you do? What I said to my student as he was dying of cancer, when it was clear that he had no hope of living other than a complete medical miracle to turn his situation around. After we both cried and lamented and wept, I said to him, quoting Viktor Frankl in his memoir, Man's Search for Meaning, I said, you know, I don't, understand it fully, but as people are suffering and coming close to death, there's a way that the light pierces through the darkness and don't turn away from the light. You may have to endure tremendous amounts of suffering before you get to the fullness of the light, but don't run from the light. Wait for it, look for it. When I got home that night, I felt completely overwhelmed and exhausted and in shock and unbelief that this young person was dying of cancer. 
at the same time, I felt an indescribable joy from having been able to be near him as he died and for having been able to come up with some words that gave some kind of meaning to this horrible situation. So going back to Roger Scruton, experiences of beauty can be profoundly disturbing. At the same time, there can be a tremendous light in them. So part of what, part of the discussions I've had with students over the years is to help guide them when these really difficult moments come along, the sickness of a loved one, the sickness of a parent, the death of a relative. These are profound experiences that we have to be able to endure the suffering in order to get to the light. And it is not easy. But I think it's a profound mistake to try to eradicate the pain. We need to try to lessen suffering whenever we can, but we can't ultimately eradicate it because death is part of human life. So we need to have a way to help people who are struggling with these problems that can't be solved with these mysteries of human life. I've seen this as well in my research that I did with people who have struggled with addiction. Someone who's addicted to a drug isn't only a problem to be solved. They're still a person with these capacities of the soul to experience beauty. And there should be a way to nurture the humanity of people who are suffering under the weight of addiction in a way that's different to, maybe complementary to curing their medical problem or their what, whatever we think addiction is. There needs to be a way to nurture the souls of people who are going through long, hard battles with things they may not be able to overcome fully in this life, whether that be addiction, whether that be some forms of chronic mental illness. There are aspects of human life that are painful and enduringly so. And I'm absolutely convinced that experiences of beauty and shared experiences of beauty are a way of opening up the creativity and the intellect and opening up these deeper human capacities. And we shouldn't stop simply at treating the biological or the psychological or the cultural elements of addiction and mental illness. Hey, those are important. You know, we need to be able to talk about that. But there's something deeper going on as well. So to just summarize, I think what I've been trying to say is that I think in our culture, a lot of people suffer from a crisis of attention and a lack of imagination. And I think this has to do with some of our educational practices that are ultimately related to these educational philosophies that I've been discussing. And I wanna suggest that these deep philosophical readings that I'm talking about here are supposed to be challenging but they're also opening up, I think, different avenues for thinking about education, whether that's K to 12 education, higher education, science education, um, fine arts. I think that entering into these debates about what is beauty, what is aesthetics, how is it related to different capacities of reasoning and knowing is challenging, but it needs to be back on the table because I think it has profound implications profound implications across all fields of education and ultimately on culture, politics, and the family. Thank you. <laughs>